Olá, o meu nome é Luís, eu trabalho para a 2600 a partir de Portugal. Sou companheiro dos meus amigos Carl e do, e do James e trabalho essencialmente em Erlang. Em Erlang. Oi, oi. Is it on now? Can you hear? Is it okay? Coming out in English? Okay. Sorry, my my real-time translator some, sometimes just crashes. It's early. So, my name is Luis. I work with 26 Hertz for the last 18 months. I work at uh, the core Erlang team, and I'm here to, to try to explain how to tune the Kazoo platform for 10,000 10, or more devices. Okay? So, people love to talk about scaling. Some vendors pitch that their systems go like 100,000 calls uh, or 5,000 calls a second, but you have to ask them what features do they enable when they do have those kinds of numbers, right? For instance, are they call recording? Are they doing uh, DTMF stuff? Are they doing ethernet transfers? Are they doing API call controls, right? So what happens is that each customer does have different usage patterns, right? And so your system must be uh, able to provide all, all the possible features that we can provide, right? And we believe that Kazoo does a good job of that. So there is no cookie cutter solution for that, right? You have to monitor your deployment. You have to make it grow. You, ha you will have to keep adding servers, right? And so the design of review of, of the Kazoo platform, obviously we have based on Linux, which is a, a very important part of the system, right? And then CouchDB, Camellio, Rabbit, and Erlang, that's our core library. So I'm going to try to explain the tweaks that you can make to help your platform work better. Okay? So for instance, in Linux, it is important that you know the limits that your system has, right? So how many times did you end up without enough file, file descriptors that were to be used by some application? So how many times does your Camellio hands out, ends up without sockets to be open because you have too many TCP connections open and you're not using UDP but only using TCP, for instance, right? What about the limits that are imposed on memory on the processes? You should also be aware of that. And obviously, these limits can also be tweaked within the operating system, and that's generally for each component of the Kazoo platform. Okay? So, obviously, important stuff like the logs, which tend to be very chatty because we do need feedback to see how, how the system behaving, right? But do we have enough uh, storage to, 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 to store, <laughs> I'm sorry, to store the logs, right? Are we shipping the logs to another server through a UDP connection? Are we doing that? Does the other server accept that? So check your operating system and make, it, make sure that it is working properly. That's the most important thing. Without it, 
then kazoo wouldn't work if you only have if you have a limit on file descriptors like like 10 so taking that back of the linux let's talk about each of the components and what we can do for that obviously the couch is what goes through all the, your cluster right you deploy your CouchDB servers, and you should plan ahead. And that will save you a lot of headaches. You should think, if I want to have 100,000 accounts within two years, then you should provide the servers right now. OK, so that is important. The next thing would be, how am I going to, to deploy those servers in each data center? Or am I creating more than one zone on the same data center? That is also important. And in a sense that if you create more than one zone in the same data center, then you can easily pick up that zone and move it to another place, right? That, that's the truth. So basically, there are three parameters that you have to put in in Couch so that he knows what to. How does this work? Like, I don't know. No. Uh, I'm sorry. So ZNW parameters, which is how many, how many zones, how many copies of. Uh, document do we want and after after how many rights do we does couch says that it's good to go so set this when you first start the number of data centers zones but remember you can have more than one zone on the same data center okay the number of copies the number of rights before it's good enough to move Later, you can find in the community repo, I believe, there's a DB tool that can help you reshard the, the whole database. Right. Free switch. Drawing up your cluster would make it uh, easily, can make it, can be made easily if you do it horizontally and if you're using um, multiple virtual machines, right? You just deploy one after the, after the other. You will, you will have like 200, 200 calls a second. That can easily be managed by a free switch server. More than that, well, it has to be a good virtual machine. You can, can also do it on Docker, of course. But bare metal is the way to go if you really want to make it stable and make it grow, just have even cheap hardware, but do it bare metal, right? It's very different to have five times 200 calls or have one time 1,000 calls, right? Um, there's also an issue with free switch when to keep track of all the dialogues, if, you, if you're going to a, to a bare metal server that supports a thousand calls. Um, free switch keeps the dialogues in a in-memory database, which is using SQLite. But sometimes it locks memory, so performance can be affected by that. Moving it back to MySQL will tend to help. Uh, also, on Modkazoo, what happened is that we pick up the events that FreeSwitch launches and we pass them on to eCall Manager, right? We, we open a TCP connection and we're saying each channel variable, we pick that and send it to eCall Manager. The less data that goes in and out, it's better, right? We're starting to deploy a, a, a 
a feature on Mod Kazoo that will by default actually sense all headers because sometimes uh, we do need to observe all headers, but we're also having the filters that's a list of the events that are filtered and sent back to Eco Manager. Is that clear? Right? Okay. So this is about it, what we do in, in Free Switch. So in Emilio, number of workers, of TCP workers, are, you, are we using UDP or are we using TCP? That is a huge difference, right? Maybe you heard from Daniel, and you will better know than me, that supporting only T TCP, it will keep the connection open, right? We like UDP because for desk phones, for instance, is much better. Uh, and we will keep reopening and closing and reusing the connections. One other thing, one side effect is that if you have to restart Camellio, all your registrations in UDP will still be, will still be valid, right? While the TCP registrations will be dropped. So if you have a quick start on the Camellio server, for some instance, for uh, adjusting memory or so, when it restarts, you will keep the registrations and it will, it will sync with eCall Manager if that feature is enabled. One of the things you want to take care of also is shared memory. So basically, uh, Camellio holds a, a lot of data uh, in memory like ACLs, um, traffic, uh, traffic role related data, the um, present status, registrations, and so on. They will keep it on shared memory. So you must make sure that although we work with commodity hardware, uh, and Camille does not need too many package memory, but on the shared memory part, if you're going to provide a lot of registrations over one server, then you must make sure that you provide enough shared memory for Camellio. One of the things you may want to optimize is like changing the database driver that we use inside Camellio. So for instance, Camellio can hold lots of registrations and presence data in shared memory and also put it back to a database, right? Or you can configure Camellia not to use the shared memory and only use the database. We use dbtext and we've made some improvements to that so that we think it's usable. Uh, but you may want to take that out and create a MySQL instance, maybe even in memory. Uh, I don't see a great benefit unless you just want to go into MySQL and issue some select statements to de for debugging purposes. Camellio now supports zones within AMQP, so you can have the zones that you want with one or more connection to each, to each zone. Of course, you will have to look at your AMQP workers and consumers, which we have differentiated so that we can optimize how we consume the messages that are directly to Camellio. And also use async when possible. Okay? So, I believe the out-of-the-box configuration for Camellio right, right now um, uses a blocking a thread that issues a call to, to the registrar app and waits for an answer, right? And it blocks that connection. So we've 
done some some uh, improvements on that, and you can start to uh, to change your scripts to use async when possible. So, for instance, a zone configuration you can probably know about this, right? You have your local configuration file where you define your AMQP URLs. You can see that the, the first three uh, are simple. They just have user pass password at some server. I pointed out here that they do belong to the same zone. It's like LX1, 2, and 3. Uh, is connecting to the individual individual servers on the AMQP cluster, on the Rabbit cluster, okay? The second one is where you define the zone, right? That's the difference. You can do it in any, right? But you can put there zone equals LX2, for instance, and that will become the secondary zone, right? The first one, or omitted, will be the, your primary zone, and it works, and it, then Camellio starts to work as equal manager or any other app works. The, f the main pushes and, con and consumes comes from the primary, but it will also listen to the other zones. For instance, when you, let's say that one device registers in one Camellio server, right? And then you want to change the password for that, Camille, for that device. Within Crossbar, we will issue an AMQP message that Camillo listens to, and it will empty the cache for that registration. So the next time the, the device tries to register, it doesn't, it doesn't fail <laughs> with a new password. Uh, the third one is another approach you may be using, and we will be talking, that instead of connecting to each of the Rabbit uh, servers individually, you can actually connect to an HA proxy, which is a low balance, uh, <laughs> a cheap low, low, low balancer, and it also works for Rabbit, right? So then in Nature Proxy, you would configure the number of nodes that you have on RabbitMQ. So, uh, an example of how we change the, the scripts, for instance, you can now see that there's a kazoo async query that takes two extra parameters, which is the routes that will execute on success and on error. It's quite easy. So, what about the WAPs and how do we extend the cluster and make it flow, right? So you start with one server, you get every WAP on the same server, right? You have crossbar, registrar, fax, call flow, anyone. It will be on one server. Then you might want to start to add more app servers, right? And by adding more app servers, doesn't necessarily mean to add another machine or a real server. You can actually start another virtual machine, uh, another Erlang virtual machine with different um, node name, right, within the same server. But you can start to, uh, to separate where each individual uh, web can, sh should run. One of the most important will be the register that you want to put it. The first one to put it aside, right, because it's critical when you get a lot of registrations. Also, on the registrar, there was an enhancement, which is you can actually, by default, registrar app starts and it opens one channel in, and starts to, con to consume the messages that Camellio sends. You can actually tweak the, the registrar app and start more than one in instance of those listeners. 
so it will support more, re more registrations at a time. So, but basically, one server to server, you start to split them out, group them by functionality, like having the API server on one side, maybe have the fax on the other side, maybe have call control like call flow and Konami and stuff in another one. And that's how you should progress your cluster. So I talked about this, the, our chip load balancer component, which is a chip proxy. We can use it for SMTP or Couch or the REST API or WebSockets or Rabbit, right? Any protocol can be done with the, can be proxied with HA proxy. One of, one of the cool things about it is that it can also make the, the SSL termination in the sense that if you're going to secure your REST API, you can actually just deploy one certificate within HA proxy. And HA proxy then will send to the port 80 on crossbar, right? So you can just deploy the servers and don't have to go and copy, configure the, the Erlang machine with a certificate. It doesn't have to be that way. Actually, it will create more load inside the Erlang machine if you go and configure the, the certificates there and start SSL on Crossfire. Okay, so going to Rabbit. You have to take care of <laughs> RabbitMQ configuration has some defaults that, for instance, wouldn't allow you to process more than 1,000 messages uh, a second, for instance, right? It has those thresholds that it hits, and you must adjust them, you must read the documentation on RabbitMQ uh, to see how can I optimize in, th in, in terms of... In, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to me. One of the things that you may want to disable, which is enabled by default, is granular statistics. You can gain 10% on performance on the newest RabbitMQ, and which is 355, I believe, something like, something like, like, like that. You will want to cluster your rabbit, like providing two or more servers, cluster them together in a LAN, so that you can have more endpoints that, that consumers can, can, can connect to, and work, working uh, much, much faster. And then you want to enable, definitely, you want to enable federation zones. Let's see how we do that. For instance, the clustering side of Rabbit, what it is, it's high available queues. And that's it. It works together. Three, four, five servers, they all work together. When a queue is created, the queue is created in one node. This, is, this you must know, right? So if I create a registrar, queue that is shared across all registrar uh, instances that are running, the first one that creates the queue, that queue is going to be created in one distinct server. Okay? Of course, the other consumers will connect to any node and will still be able to consume from, from that queue. And that's how clustering works. The problem is that since the queue is created and binded to one of the nodes, what happens if your node goes down? Right? So what happens is that all consumers will crash. Right? And then they will start, let me connect again, 
the queue doesn't exist, and maybe what is going to happen is that you'll end up with several registrar queues in each of the nodes and with plenty of errors, right? So, and that's why Rabbit on a clustered environment can replicate those defini the definitions of one, one queue from one server to, to, to another, right? We just say, this registrar queue it must be available all on all nodes independently of the, if a node goes down, right? That's high availability. You do that by creating policies for replication on Rabbit management interface, okay? You just say, this queue must be available, H, HI available, read the docs, it's real simple. And, and that will assure you that even if a node go, go, goes down, your critical queues will still work across all other consumers. And that, of course, is for LAN only. Okay? Doesn't work well in WAN environments. Oh. Yeah. So, what about federation? There's a federation plugin out of the box on RabbitMQ. Probably you already meet, know, know this. Probably you already know. What you don't know is that the way it works is that it configures upstream servers and pulls the messages down to one server. And then you will have one, one consumer going to the downstream and it will consume the messages from the upstream. And this is how it works, right? What RabbitMQ doesn't give you an option is to give a granular control of what we want. So you can actually federate queues or exchanges, right? But still, if you're only consuming based on a routing key and you have one consumer taking messages for equal manager, for instance, for the channel create event, you still get all the other messages going from upstream to downstream and they will just be, be dropped because nobody, con nobody consumes them. Right? So, Mr. Anderson and Mr. James Ebonetti, they came up with a, a different solution. So, that is, we have primary zones and, and we have other zones. And so, our Rabbit library, what it does, it does the main business with a primary zone where it sends all the data that he wants to publish. It consumes the data from the primary zone. And then, by configuration, we would also consume messages from the other zones. And we'll do that based on exchanges and routing keys. So we will only be consuming what we actually need and don't have all this traffic going through servers. Is that clear how it works? Okay. So if you, I know this isn't much of rocket science or nothing, right? This is more advices on how you can progress your, your cluster. But if you, can, if, if you follow some of these steps like clustering, to get more visibility, to get more performance, and also you you create your CouchDB servers up front with the number of accounts you expect within two years, then you will end up with scenarios like this. For instance, a, a simple CP scenario. You will get register for a one register authentication request going to couch 
authentication response, user location within Camellio, and then registration su success, and then eCall manager finally gets the registration, right? So what you're seeing here is that two Camellio servers on very commodity hardware, and actually they were VMs, uh, with two Kazoo registrar instances, each one of them with four listeners, with a, a cluster of two servers in Rabbit, we are showing that with the new changes that we made to Camellio to work in an async way, we can actually hit 5,800 registrations per second, doing this path all the way. This is without any caching at all. We disable caching so that we would uh, prove that, that this is what actually happens on the target and on the registrar. So these are pretty cool, cool numbers. Most of the phones register every 360 seconds or so. So potentially, in theory, you would have more than 2 million reg registrations supported only clustering two, two rabbit servers. OK? So summing up, how would you progress your server? You create one all-in-one server, right? Just for fun. Then you, if you're taking it seriously, the first thing you would do is, yeah, let's take couch out of, out of this all-in-one and let's put in, let, let's, let's de de deploy the old servers that we expect to be in two years. And then you start getting some calls and maybe it's time to move to another free switch. You take free switch all of the, out of the all-in-one. Uh, freeing some resources in the all-in-one and putting it work on their own servers or VMs or Docker. Then you'll go and start creating the apps, the app servers. Then you'll go and make it on the rabbit. And then eventually you will add another free switch and more apps and more rabbits and so on, right? And when you're comfortable, then you just start all over again and create a new zone and start progressing your server. You go from the East Coast to the Middle West and then to the West Coast, and then you take the States, then probably you will go into the Atlantic and fly over Europe, you just start your one of theirs, right, in London, then you go to Paris, Berlin, so on, and you can take the world. Okay, so maybe you'll get some feedback from the community, from other space, I don't know. And that's it. That's my presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Cool.